Good evening. Uh, welcome to the 2018 open hearing. Um, I'm going to take a minute to introduce the committee. We have Gordon Kinder, Brooks Gurner, Amy Baskin, James Stewart, I'm Kate Canney, it's Erica Alders, Andrew Ursetti, Fred Hammerly, and John Cohn. I, and I want to thank you for all joining us tonight. Tonight's meeting provides us with the opportunity to review both the operating budget, capital budget, and articles that will be on the warrant for the May 7th, 2018 uh, town meeting. And that will be for fiscal year 2019. Throughout the fall of, and early this winter, we have met with various departments and sponsors of articles to review their budgetary impact and the impact in general on the town. The financial amounts we're going to be presenting tonight are preliminary and will be... Oh, I'm sorry, is this better? Is that better? No? Okay. 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 All right. Uh, the financial amounts uh, that are being presented tonight are preliminary and the final amounts will be in the blue book. Each year the warrant committee uh, composes a guidance letter that was sent to all of the town departments. Copies of this guidance letter are available in the back of the room. This year we recommended a level service budget and we requested that if any department had any item that would be above level service that they discuss it with us and present that information. Also we supported the personnel board's recommendation of a 2.5 percent increase in general salary. This year we have 28 warrant articles. 17 of these articles are recurring articles, 11 are special, uh, non-recurring articles. Of the 17, 13 have associated expenditures and financial impact. Of the 11 non-recurring articles, six have associated costs. Of the recurring articles, we have Article 3, elected official salaries, Article 4, operating budget, Article 5, capital budget, Article 6, unemployment compensation fund, Article 7, accumulated sick leave for retired police, Article 16, funding of the Conservation Commission Conservation Trust, Articles 19 and 20, the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee capital items. We anticipate that Article 20 will be withdrawn and that Article uh, 19 will be used to pay for those capital items out of the general budget. Article 23 is the reserve fund for FY 2019. Article 24, unpaid bills of a prior year. Article 25, supplemental appropriations for FY 18. Article 26, free cash applied to the FY 19 budget. Article 27, stabilization fund. Articles 20, 25, and 27 are expected to be withdrawn. Articles with associated expenditures which are non-occurring are Article 2, the reevaluation of all properties by the Board of Assessors. Article 8, the establishment of a recycling committee revolving fund. Article 11, replacement of boilers at the Carroll Community Center. Article 12, the funding of a hydrology study. Article 15, borrowing for costs for the Carroll Community Center improvements. Article eight, uh, 17, excuse me, update of the 2011 Open Space Recreation Plan. Articles without associated expenditures include Article 1, committee reports from, ta the, t committee reports from the town annual report. Article 9, the revolving fund accounts. Article 10, state highway funds. Article 28, the annual, ba annual ballot for the town election. Non-recurring articles without anticipated expenditures. Article 13, the demolition review bylaw. Article 14, a ban on the commercial use of plastic bags. Article 18, borrowing logistics. Article 21, revision of wireless communication updates. And Article 22, the prohibition of the operation of a marijuana establishment. So the next two slides will just give you an overview of the order in which we will be reviewing things this evening. We'll begin with Article 4, the operating budget, and that will include the Dover School Committee's budget and the Dover 
Sherburn Regional School Committee budget. That will also include their capital items. That will be followed by Article 5, the capital budget. We will then return to Article 2, the re-evaluation of properties. Article 8, the establishment of a recycling committee revolving fund. Article 11, replacement of boilers at the Carroll Community Center. Article 12, funding for the hydrology study. Article 13, demolition review bylaw. Article 14, ban of commercial use of plastic bags. Article 15, borrowing to pay the costs of proposed improvements to the Carroll Community Center. Article 17, update to the 2011 open space and recreational plan. Article 18, borrowing logistics. Article 21, revisions to the wireless communications bylaw. Article 22, of, uh, the operation, prohibition of the operation of a marijuana establishment. Just the standard operating procedure for tonight. We will take citizens' questions and comments upon the completion of all of the presentation on the individual article. I'd ask that you come up to the microphone. Please state your name and your address. We're on TV, and that's a requirement we have for this meeting. And try to limit your comments to two minutes. Thank you. Uh, the first uh, presentation will be our, the Operating Budget Article 4 by Eric Alders. Okay, thanks for coming tonight. I'm Erica Alders, and on behalf of the Warrant Committee, I'm going to present Article 4, which is the operating budget for fiscal year 2019. So we'll, go, we'll first go through the operating budget and then have a discussion on free cash and then an update on town meeting. So you can see here this year's article for operating budget. This is proposed, as Kate mentioned, as of today. It's at 37,706,968. That represents a little over 800,000 increase from last year, or 2.3%. The total expenditures uh, predicted as of today are $40,063,033, which is an increase of a little over a million dollars, and that's up 2.7%. The total revenues, excluding the use of free cash, are $38,713,037, which is an increase of a little over a million dollars, or 2.7%. And the use of free cash right now, this is the minimum that would be necessary to uh, balance the budget, is $1,349,996. Uh, this is actually a decrease from last year of about $1.5, $1.6 million, or down 53.7%. This is a summary of some of the large changes from last year's expenditures. So uh, the increases, the schools overall have gone up about $319,000, and they're going to have a presentation tonight as well. Um, group health insurance is up $235,000. <coughs> Other insurance, protection of persons and properties, Norfolk County retirement, uh, the Conservation Committee, trail maintenance has requested an additional $20,000 over last year, and town email services uh, represents a migration of the town emails to the Google platform, and that's at about $11,000. On the other side, we have uh, one substantial decrease. Uh, the solid waste disposal is down $31,000, 7.6%, and that's largely due to the banning of the commercial haulers at the transfer station. Uh, you can see that the above increase and decreases account for uh, about 94.2% of the changes to the budget, so a good chunk. <coughs> This slide just briefly highlights some items in Article 5, which is the capital items, and special articles. Um, Article 5 is down 35.7%. Um, special articles are up 148%. And special articles other are down 11%. That's special articles other includes the boilers, and last year it included the air conditioning at the school. Um, some of the special articles and other articles they have, as Kate mentioned, replacement of the boilers, the hydrology study, and the Conservation Commission Fund Supplement, but there are also others. Here's a chart just to see graphically. You can see the operating budget, as you might guess, is the largest component. Um, we've got debt service, the special articles, capital items, um, prior year snow and ice deficit. About 92 of the expenses fall under Article 4. Uh, this one is spending by category, so the schools are the biggest chunk together. They're about 58 percent. 
Um, the, in the other category is uh, Parks and Recreation, the Council on Aging, uh, Cemetery, Library. You can see there's debt service and insurance and pensions. Those are non-discretionary items. Um, protective services includes police, fire, ambulance, and emergency management. This shows the estimated revenue. Uh, the large chunk of it's coming from the tax levy. Uh, and then there are some other uh, items there as well, including the use of three, free cash. And when you come to this one, you can see the total revenues over the total expenditures. And the gap there is the minimum amount of free cash that's going to be needed to balance the budget. And the Warren Committee, as it has in the past, will recommend an amount at town meeting um, of free cash. They consider the town finances, predicted financial needs, uses and expectations over the near and long terms, as much as they can, the town's credit rating, tax rates, and other factors in making a recommendation for the use of free cash. Warrant committees reviewing the free cash as they do every year, and then at the town meeting, they will present a recommendation regarding the use of free cash. So free cash, it's a revenue source that results from the calculation as of July 1 of a community's remaining unrestricted funds from its operations of the previous fiscal year based on the balance sheet as of June 30th. Um, you can see our free cash as of July 1, 2017 was about 7.9 million. Uh, which is a decrease. The free cash from July 1, 2016 was about 8.1 million. And the annual town meeting is going to be May 7th, 2018. Uh, the blue books are going to be sent to households ahead of the meeting from the Warren Committee. And it will be at 7 p.m. in the Allen Mudge Auditorium at the Dover Sherburn Regional High School. Thank you. We'll now have a presentation of the Dover School Committee. Good evening, Henry Spaulding, Dover School Committee. Uh, while the presentation is up in, um, on the screen in a second, I want to thank everybody for last year for our capital ask of our air conditioning at Chickering School. Thank the Warren Committee, the Slackman, um, the town taxpayers. It was a game changer for the school, the students, the, um, the teachers, all of the administration, and even the visitors have greatly appreciated it. So thank you very much. And also another piece of good news is we are not asking for any more air conditioning. We're not asking for any capital asks this year, so I'm just presenting the um, operating budget. Kind of hard to read, but the first thing that we're doing is um, the superintendent is working on five core objectives for the, for the region as a whole, and we're going to talk about those quite frequently through the years. Uh, the first, I mean, pardon me, the last one on your far right, I just want to highlight because it's a kind of a key component as we think about how we um, operate and manage our schools. I'll read it so I get it right. It says, um, resource efficiency provide the highest quality education in an efficient and productive manner. So we keep that in mind as we start to um, sort of formulate our budget and also work closely with the Warren Committee. So our budget is um, sustainable and responsible for the town. Uh, we have a focus on a le learning environment that is consistent and delivers measurable learning outcomes. And as you know, we're reported to be one of the top school systems in the state, which we're very proud of. It's compliance with state mandates, school district policies, and it also keeps in mind um, the town's assets and facilities. So here's a quick overview on our approach. Um, working with the Town Finance Committee, we have an appreciation for the town finances, adhere to the Dover Warrant Committee's guidelines, as well as provide level service. Um, this budget does not include uh, health care that's covered in the town health care costs. It does not include revenues received back from the state for Chapter 70, as well as circuit breaker um, reimbursements we get for um, out-of-district expenses for um, special ed. And as I mentioned, we are not asking for a capital increase or a capital ask. So highlight, uh, the budget is made up of two areas. One is the school system, Chickering School, and then out-of-district costs. And I'll touch on both of those. You'll see uh, for Chickering, we have um, a budget with an increase of 1.8%, which is about $123,000. The out-of-district costs are uh, basically level of just over $1,000 for a total um, budget versus 2018 of 1.26%, or 
for a total of $10,437,000 and a little bit more. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Um, the bottom part it gets a little bit more difficult to see, so we'll, we'll work on that. But um, a couple of the highlights, as I mentioned, it's about $128,000 increase ask. Uh, this is what's made up of some of the, um, the highlights here. Um, based on estimated um, enrollment for 2018, we have a de decrease of $60,000 in the budget uh, based on one selection being uh, reduced. I'm sorry, one section. Uh, we have an increase of 165000 for uh, teacher salaries. Um, I want to highlight we are adding um, half of an FTE for fifth grade for our uh, FLESS program. This is a program that was started for Spanish um, for kindergartners a few years ago, and as they age into further grades, we need to staff appropriately, so we have uh, the fifth grade class now taking Spanish, which is great. Um, we've added two SPED, um, SPED special ed, um, assistance, and that was added in 2018, covered in 2018, but we need to have it reflected in the 19 budget. You can read most of those. Uh, towards the bottom, I just want to touch on the business office staff reduction. Uh, highlights the efficiencies that we're increasing, uh, picking up. That's a $13,000 decrease. And then the bottom one, uh, based on some historical trends, we've adjusted the um, maintenance expenses down to uh, down $9,300. Seen that slide, moving on to out of district. So, um, most of you are probably familiar with the um, out of district requirements. It's a federally mandated program that we, um, as a town, uh, support students with disabilities ranging from the age of 3 to 22 that cannot receive services within our school system. Uh, services need to meet legal standards that are free, appropriate in public education and be provided in the least restrictive environment. We estimate 32 students um, this year will be uh, receiving services out of district. Um, and as I mentioned, we do not um, include the circuit breaker reimbursement, which we estimate to be about $990,000 that will come back to the town. How it's made up. Uh, like I mentioned, it's pretty flat, so we have some decreases early. Uh, we have five individuals that have either graduated or aged out of uh, the program. Um, two placements uh, have moved back into the district, which is wonderful, and that has to do with some of the programs we've added. Uh, one placement has moved out of, out of town, uh, so that's you know, 300, almost $400,000 right there. Um, some of the increases have to do with some people moving back into town, some people needing further services, uh, I want to highlight the transportation costs, which I believe, according to our administration, is uh, not very common, is actually decreasing by $58,000. And just uh, quickly, one more item on the out of district. Um, we've implemented several new initiatives. Uh, as I mentioned, it's brought some of the students back into the district. Uh, we have language-based and life skills program at the high school. That's the program there. We, um, in 2016, created an integrated preschool, which has allowed us to identify uh, needs for our uh, students and keep them in uh, classes um, at Chickering. So that's a great uh, response to innovation protocol. Uh, we continue to work across district with uh, some of the um, resources we have with the region as well as with uh, Pine Hill to uh, get some efficiencies there. And then we have uh, the circuit breaker reimbursement noted at the bottom. And that's it. Um, the um, presentation is available on our website. Right there, you can take a look at it. And any comments? Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have the regional school budget. Hi, I'm Laurie Crusoe, and I am very grateful to be here sharing the budget with you. So as you know, the mission of the Dover Sherborne Regional Schools is to inspire, challenge, and support all students as they discover and pursue their full potential. As we approached the budget, we were goal-driven, as Henry mentioned, in the proposed strategic objectives. Uh, of course, resource efficiency is a top priority for us, as is uh, pursuing innovative teaching and learning, 
health and well-being of students and staff, partnerships with families and communities, and safe and innovative facilities. Our budgetary focus was to review and revise educational services, to evaluate and maintain grounds and facilities, to remain fiscally responsible and mindful of financial constraints. And we will be continuing, or we have continued, to the trend budgeting that was started about three years ago, and a focus for fiscal 19 on spending smarter. Uh, we must comply with federal and state mandates, of course, and we must fund our contractual obligations. These are our drivers. The town guidance from Dover was level service, and from Sherborne, it was level funded with a 1.5% increase for salaries. Advisory has also set aside a reserve for town departments to submit additional requests for potential funding. Uh, our enrollment projections remain con uh, constant for the foreseeable future. Our collective bargaining and contractual obligations are set and based on the negotiation that just occurred. Our health care costs do reflect changes to plan design and offerings. And we are keeping pace or ahead of health care marketplace changes. We have hired an outside consulting firm to help us to stay on top of that for cost containment. Uh, the overview of the operating budget, as you will see, we have salary and compensation, $15,928,385. That is our big number. Benefits are over $4 million. Other expenditures, $1,337,482. Transportation costs are $810,859. And buildings and ground expenditures are $1,290,906. For grand total, with debt service added of just over a million, of twenty-four million six hundred and fourteen thousand eight hundred and sixteen dollars. As you'll see, this uh, proposed operating budget is a slight increase, two point eleven percent, or five hundred and nine thousand two hundred and thirty-one dollars. Uh, member town assessments are up 371,750. Uh, seven, chapter 70 and 71 amounts are up. It's funding from our state up to uh, the tune of $124,771. And excess and defi deficiency, 12,710 is up for revenue. Uh, our expenditures, again, our enrollment is between 1,207 students to 1,223 students, depending on the time of year for the assessment. Um, we did have that 2% increase in salary for the top 1% for the top step on the matrix, and then the remainder of the matrix is increasing 1%. Uh, all other contractual salary increases are 2%. So that increases, that's a big driver, is 575000 for an increase in salaries. Uh, we had some retirements that were confirmed as of February 1st, and that gains us $150,000 salary reduction. Uh, the employee-related insurance costs include the Norfolk County Retirement, Workers' Comp, Medicare Employer Tax, and Health Care. That's an increase of 157000 the net effect of the continued trend budgeting is a decrease or reduction of $39,500 for smarter budgeting. And uh, we are in the fourth year of our five-year bus contract, which is a benefit to us. And so we only have an increase of $6,664 for our bus contract. And we have a decrease in debt, principal, and interest payments of 22,000 and change. Uh, revenue project projections, 21,547,183. State funding, uh, 2,561,833. Student fees and other associated fees, 355,750. And e and funds we'll be using this year uh, towards the operating budget are 150,000. So projected revenue is 
Uh, Dover's share of this projected fiscal year 19, we have operating, uh, our operating share is 11,474,779. Our share of the debt is $568,138. Finally, uh, Dover total is $12,000,000. $42 and nine, I'm sorry, $12,042,917 for our share of the budget. Uh, moving on to capital. Capital was fairly straightforward this year. We have paving at the middle school, fire detention, uh, fire detection field sensors. We have tile replacement. We have a new tractor for the grounds that is um, in desperately need of replacement. We have storage, Dell utility storage for the um, computers. We have a roof that is leaking and needs to be repaired at the high school. We have a walk-in freezer that needs to be replaced. Uh, the boys' locker room floor has been replaced with a great new product, um, or will be replaced with a great new product. AC ductless unit for the special ed offices that were recently moved when we opened up the new pro a new program last year and they just don't have um, air conditioning back there. Uh, we'll have some concrete work done at the front of the health office and then exhaust and ventilation work campus wide. So the total for capital is 510,000. And then, of course, we wouldn't be where we are without our community investment, our total for which we are so very, very thankful. Uh, 300,000 from the community, and that is through boosters, DSEF, FOPA, Positive, PTO, the Mudge Foundation, Needham Bank, and other private, and, uh, other private companies and parties. We are very, very thankful for their support. Uh, we thank you for your time and um, your support for the region. Any questions on operating budget, Article 4? Okay, we'll now proceed to Article 5, the capital budget. Hi, uh, Bob Springett. I'm the chairman of the Capital Budget Committee. And I always like to start by thanking all the town employees, the commissioners and committee members who've taken the time to answer all the questions we've asked and to sit with us as we reviewed and vetted the different capital item requests. And I'd also like to thank the members of the committee who also spent a fair amount of time researching and reviewing the requests as well as discussing and vetting them. So thank you. I really, so fiscal year 19 um, on this chart represents kind of a low point. I think we're in the trough of uh, capital requests. Uh, for fiscal year 19, Article 5 requests are at $262,700 down from uh, the prior fiscal year. And the regional school, uh, our percentage of the regional school uh, capital request is $288,711 for a total of $550,000 plus. Um, in general, the, the, the uh, capital request items have been in about that range. Um, and we're down about $60,000 from fiscal year 18. But as you go forward uh, through time, you can see fairly significant increases from both the region and from Dover in terms of projected capital requests. So I'll just try to be brief uh, and go through some of the major drivers. Uh, could you go back? Bill, thanks. For uh, fiscal year 20, we have a heavier than usual set of requests. One more. Um, 
for under Article 5, uh, equipment requests and vehicle requests by highway, park and rec and police, and building maintenance uh, requests for the protective agencies re-roofing. Those are the major drivers there. Again, this is all the green. I'll go through the region. Um, for fiscal year 21, again, it's vehicle replacements, fire and ambulance and highway, and then facilities maintenance at Chickering. For fiscal year 22, uh, we have townhouse re-roofing. For fiscal year 23, vehicle replacements highway, facilities maintenance at Chickering. And we have kind of a placeholder uh, by the police for their radio systems replacement. Um, we're not quite sure when that'll be done. And so the chief always has that out in the out years uh, so that we have it on our radar uh, screens. The blue, the, uh, the region, uh, really um, two big jumps in fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 22. In fiscal year 20, that's uh, high school roof replacement. And in fiscal year 23, it's middle school and linguist roof replacements. So that's a couple of big spikes. And then in fiscal year 23, um, I think it's boiler replacement at both the middle school and the high school. So that's the trend that we're looking at as we go forward over the next several years. Back to Article 5. Specific, go ahead, Bill. One more. So we only have three requests from town departments this year. Uh, a fire incident command vehicle for the fire department. This is to replace a 1990 vehicle with about 135,000 miles on it, which is expected to grow to 150,000 when it gets replaced. Highway Department has a six-wheel dump truck that they use in the wintertime for, for uh, snow plow removal and sanding, and I think Craig said that after this winter, this baby had to get replaced. So um, it's this 19, also a 1990 vehicle. It, um, it uh, will be replaced by a similar truck with stainless steel body um, to extend, which should extend its, its uh, useful life. Since we got close to 30 years out of, the, out of the 1990 model, I'm not quite sure how long this truck will be in service. Um, and then finally, a police department, an SUV. Um, this vehicle will have about 80,000 miles on in the term time of replacement in about a year. Um, and this one is an interesting one. It, it, for the past several years, we've been, we've been working with the town departments to kind of refine the guidelines we use for vehicle and equipment replacement. And there's, we, uh, for this one, we actually uh, surveyed six similar towns, similar in population size uh, and similar in the sort of a rural character to them. Um, and four out of the six um, towns came back to us and all have a marker of about 100,000 miles as the, the action point for their police cruises. So we feel that we're consistent with those towns um, and we have a reasonable metric to use. And we, you know, as we go forward on, on the other uh, vehicles and the other equipment, we try to survey similar like towns um, to make sure that what we do is, is sort of consistent with, with similar towns. Lori went through the, the region, our, our, um, our share of the region's 510,000 is 288,711. The, uh, the percentage applied is very similar to what's been applied last year. It's, it's off, I think, it, it's a little bit less. It's 0.07% less than last year's. So there's no need for me to go through those things. And then finally, um, the two uh, re selectmen requests, one Article 11 for boiler replacement. The, uh, the committee has not taken any action on that as of yet. And Article 15, the additional infrastructure improvements to the Carroll Building. Um, the committee voted uh, not to recommend approval of this particular request. And th there were two reasons. Um, one, the committee agrees that the building should be maintained and kept in a stable condition. And then two, the committee also believes that it's really time for the town to step back 
and decide once and for all what they want to do with the Carroll Building, what use, what purposes, what kind of space, what kind of tenancy. Um, this item has sort of been bouncing around since about 2002. Um, so I think the town needs to step up and opine as to what they would like us to do with that building. Any questions? You have to come up to the... You have to come up Actually, to the mic. Actually, you have to come up to the mic. Thank you. <laughs> it's for the television. I had a question on your article regarding the six-wheeler dump truck. Rather a small question, but back there it looked like the replacement cost was 180000 I thought maybe that was a dump trailer or a ten-wheeler, and I'm, perhaps I didn't read it right. It, it was your second or third article in the money department. Would you mind just stating your name and address? Sure, my name is Craig Rafter, 8 Grand Hill Drive, Dover, Mass. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is it's a six-wheel dump truck. Um, but Craig, if you have more to say about that. If Craig Hughes is here, he would. He would know. No, he's here. Come on, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Bob? Bob Cox, 14 Cedar Hill Road. Um, I have to admit I'm disappointed that you're not recommending the infrastructure improvements uh, in lieu of another study. This has been studied quite a bit. Can you possibly tell us what your vision is as to how this study will take place? and? what the time frames might be? Do, do I? No, I, I, uh, I don't have. I mean, I was, we talked with the selectmen, and we talked among ourselves, and we, we would hope that this kind of assessment could be done within a year. Um, but that's sort of based on a, the fact that we would rely on some of the work that was done, particularly the work in, uh, there was a committee report back in July 10 that covered many of the same issues. Um, but we think that that certainly needs to be updated and it needs to reflect what current residents want in a community center. Um, 
and it would be up to the selectmen um, to appoint a committee. I would imagine similar to how it was done with Springdale. But we, you know, we think the town ought to uh, opine on this item. I mean, if the town votes to go forward, the town votes to go forward. We're just making a recommendation, seven, seven people in the committee. So you think a, a year time frame would be appropriate? I would hope, given all the work that has been done, right? I don't, and building on that work, I can't imagine why it couldn't be done in a year. Thank you. We're going to now move on to Article 2, which is the reevaluation of properties. Every year the Board of Assessors does a revaluation based on sales in the previous year, and that's a relatively routine procedure that we do every year. Every five years the state requires a comprehensive uh, view of our assessments by an outside agency, and that's what we, this is uh, budgeted for. Uh, I understand that this is the same figure as uh, uh, we asked for the last time this had to be done. Thank you. Any questions on Article 2? Okay. We'll now move on to Article 8, the establishment of a recycling committee revolving fund. Is Would anybody like to speak to it? Thanks. I would have I briefly speak to this. This is just a new item that we've, uh, to kind of keep the book, bookkeeping uh, more cleaner, straighter, so forth. And what we're doing is we're not asking for any money. Uh, we're just establishing the uh, revolving account. It does have a $1,500 number attached to it, but that will be um, started out of the operating budget. And once that initial 1500 is in there, this is for the compost bins, um, the recycling buckets, and so forth, and garbage pails that we, we're trying to promote and uh, available to the citizens to purchase. And we, we want to just put that money back into that account so we can continue to purchase more and more and more with the proceeds from that. So it's, just, it's, it's a matter of uh, boilerplate and just keeping things uh, uh, very in line. Because just in the last year or so, we really, really um, sold a lot of those items and so forth. So it's, it's really time to um, really keep good tracking of it. So that's pretty much what it represents. But there's no dollar amount to be appropriated, that, uh, even though it says that it just has to be voted at town meeting each year as a revolving account. And those funds will be in there prior to the uh, uh, July, uh, well, July 1st. Okay. Any questions? As a quick reminder, all articles will be um, detailed in the Blue Book, so there will be additional information on that article in the Blue Book. Uh, article 8, the, uh, I'm sorry, Article 11, replacement of the uh, boilers at the Carroll Community Center. Good evening. Candace McCann, Board of Selectmen. Article 11 is about replacing the boilers at Carroll Community Center. And if you wouldn't mind, Bill, well, let's go just to like slide three under Article 11. What's interesting is that the selectmen have a statutory responsibility to maintain our town buildings. And these boilers are, as you can see, we have 41,000 square feet there. 30,000 is usable space because we have stairways and we have mechanical closets, restrooms, and things of that sort. So 30,000 square feet of usable space. It is used by our Council on Aging and it is used by Parks and Rec for all of their programming. Both programs use it for their, all of their groups, their classes, and gatherings. 
So we also additionally, we have four licensees who are using space in the Carroll as, as well. Next bill, please. The boilers are over 90 years old. And for anyone who has seen them, a picture is worth a thousand words. 90 years, they have doubled their life expectancy. Um, they are absolutely way past due in being replaced. And the problem is that we have two boilers, they go down intermittently, and we have passed the point where replacement parts are even made any longer. So the problem that we face is if both boilers go down at the same time, and if it happens to be in the, the uh, cold of winter, we would have to evacuate that program, all the programs out of the building. And that's a, a specter that none of us wants to face. Next, please. The cost will be on the outside $600,000. We expect it to come in under that, but that is the figure that's been attached for that. And our intention is to pay for it with free cash, as we did the air conditioners at Chickering last year. Small amount. We wouldn't go out for our debt on that. We would be using free cash for that amount. And I would like to use a little bit of my time rather than talking further, but I would like to introduce Camille Johnson, who's coming up. She is our chair for COA and would love to give you a little input. And then Mark Giloni will speak about Parks and Rec. Would you please, Camille? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Camille Johnston, I'm a member of the Dover Council on Aging. The Council on Aging is a stakeholder in the Carroll Community Center. This Article 11 is just for maintenance article and is of great importance to the Council on Aging. The Council on Aging needs to have the boilers replaced in the Carroll Community Center. They are too old and decrepit, as was spoken, to function efficiently and with certainty. These boilers are the lifeblood of the building. The programs offered by the council cannot function if there is no heat. Periodic shutdowns and shuffling seniors around to other buildings and places reduces the number of seniors who will use the building. Seniors do need the certainty of having the warmth and having a place to come that's consistent and open and friendly, et cetera. And we cannot do that when the boilers might break down. And that, at 90 years old, and if anybody has been to the open house and saw the boilers held together in many places with tape, uh, covered with asbestos, that is still fine, but might go any time. So the boilers really need the help as much as you can. So please vote for Article 11 and tell all your friends to come out and support the Council on Aging. Thank you. Mark? Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Mark Galoni, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, just a little bit about the, uh, the space. The building plays a vital role for us as a department um, with our program offerings. Um, if we had to, I guess it's a little less than half of our programs throughout the year happen in the building. Um, all of our indoor programs, or most of our indoor programs, happen in that building. Uh, we see less and less space available at schools. Um, so if we do have any school space, it's off peak time. So we've moved uh, a great number of our programs all into the Carroll Community Center. Um, and obviously it's for location. Uh, we have a central location for families uh, that can come to visit our office. Um, so families, participants, our office, but also some storage space and also um, program space. So it's great to have that central location um, and it's a great benefit for us. We have a, a number of rooms. The Carroll Room um, holds classes, birthday parties, meetings. We have our office for day-to-day -day operations. Um, we have a Taekwondo room. Um, we have a room for, that we use for vacation programs, after school classes. Um, and we have a small gym downstairs um, that we use for a lot of our sport programming. Um, 
We've also seen a recent trend um, for non-sport activities. Um, so recreation opportunities and not necessarily sports. So we've increased uh, number of programs such as musical theater, uh, hip hop, dance classes, home alone classes, babysitting classes. So those all take place at the Carroll Community Center um, and it plays a huge role for us. Um, in addition, we, working with COA who is in the building, um, we've collaborated with COA uh, for a number of programs, art classes, Zumba classes and pickleball classes. So all those take place in that building. So um, and the one feedback we get from a lot of our participants, our families, um, is the extremes and temperatures in the spaces. So um, whatever the space is, um, you could go in one day and it's very hot, the next week it could be um, very cold. So that's the, uh, the feedback we get um, from our participants in that space is just the extreme temperatures. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Carol Lisbon to Cross Street. Mark, uh, you mentioned tonight, and I believe you had mentioned also at the, uh, the last open public hearing you had over at the Carroll Community Center that uh, the big complaint is the extremes in temperatures. Could someone explain to me how replacing the boilers but not doing anything on the control systems in the individual classrooms will address the problem that you're addressing? Please. In a perfect world, you're absolutely right. In fact, when we get to Article 15, um, Mrs. Lisbon and I will be addressing the value of adding the controls to, in fact, move the heat around. But in the very barest sense of things, the boilers will enable us to keep the building open. That's why they're a separate item. We'll definitely be talking about the controls in a few minutes, but the, the reason we're coming to the town about the boilers is we need to keep the building open, and this is what we believe is absolutely bare minimum essential. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mark Howe, 54 Farm Street. And to uh, touch on what Carol had just mentioned, and I don't know um, if you're going to bring it up in Article 15, but have you weighed the different options of propane, oil, hy hydro, air, separate systems for less expense? Thank you. We will be doing that during the design phase. So in other words, we need the authorization from the townspeople to in fact take on the project and then during the design phase we'll be looking at the other options. So 600000 really isn't for a boiler, it's for a heating system? Well, it's the plan is that was priced out for two boilers to replace the existing boilers. But it's quite possible during the design phase that it will come in uh, with a different plan or a different proposal, but we need to have the authorization from the town, in fact, to resolve this issue. So then do we get to vote on the new proposal? The no, vote? Whatever, whatever the... The designers come back with? No, the vote will be to authorize us to go ahead and replace the boilers with what will be a part of the design phase. Okay. Good evening. My name is Jeff Merrill. I live at 14 Meadowbrook Road. And before I ask my question with regard to this, um, I just like to state that having been on the other side of the table, I'd appreciate all the work that you guys do, and I know it is voluminous, so thank you. If my memory is correct, having been on the committee a couple of years ago, this element, that being heating, was discussed, and uh, it really was talked about in terms of boilers and power control systems, which I think would have led to a cost of over six, over a million dollars, is my memory. I could be wrong, but that's what I remember from previous discussions. I just find it very hard to believe why you would do the boilers and not do the power control systems. Simple as that. That said, um, as I saw the capital budgeting committee's information, um, it didn't speak to what position the war committee has on that. Has the war committee voted or 
The Warren Committee does not vote on any articles until after open hearing, and we have not deliberated on the articles. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this article? Okay. So we'll move on to uh, Article 12, which is the hydrology study. Good evening. My name is Carol Chirico. I am a member of the Dover Board of Health Water Resources Study Committee, and I'm here with uh, Ron Myrick, who is also a member of the committee. We're going to be splitting the presentation tonight. Next slide. So the Dover Water Resources Study Committee, which I'll call the committee from here on out, is made up of five are six Dover residents who have areas of professional expertise such as environmental engineering, computer programming, law, and banking, and all of these um, professional backgrounds have been very valuable in informing the work of the committee. As you can see from this slide, our committee members are also on the planning board, the board of health, the open space committee, and have served on a variety of boards and committees in town. So I'm going to give you a little background about how the Water Resources Study Committee was established. Over the past several years, and most recently during efforts to determine the future of 48 Springdale Avenue, residents expressed concern about what intensive development there might do to the availability of groundwater. So as a result, the Board of Selectmen in March 2015 committed to establishing a groundwater study committee, and then in 2016, the Board of Selectmen mandated that the Board of Health establish such a committee. So since our first meeting in last summer, in the summer of 2017, the committee has obtained and reviewed data and public reports, determined what data is needed to gain a comprehensive understanding of Dover's groundwater resources and the demand on those resources. And we've also met with elected officials and state regulators from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection in person as, and as well as at public meetings. So at this time, the committee has three major goals. The first is to collect data on Dover's groundwater resources and obtain a professional analysis, which is the hydrology study that Ron will discuss in more detail later on. The hydrology study will help us to address potential issues and respond to anticipated state regulations that will require residents to conserve water in some fashion. And the final goal is to educate Dover residents on the status of our water, both the quality and the quantity, and understand the implications of these, future, of these findings on future real estate values and the ability to transfer property. Next slide, please. So why should we be concerned about water resources in Dover? So over the past several years, at least 15 instances of residential wells going dry, um, we've seen that occur in town. And over the past two years, um, well drillers have had to go deeper and deeper in order to gain the necessary depths to have adequate groundwater flow. We've seen evidence of perennial streams and seasonal wetlands disappearing. And we've heard from residents who are concerned that there are no water conservation measures in town. Of course, you drive through Needham or Westwood in the summer and you see signs about water restrictions, and folks wonder why we're not doing that in Dover. Um, the regulated water, wa the, the public water suppliers in Dover, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, they exceed the state standard of 65 gallons per day per person and do not impose conservation measures mandated in their DEP permits. And over the past several years, many of the Dover public water suppliers have exceeded their permitted withdrawals, some by over 100%. And finally, um, big picture perspective, scientific and government data show long-term temperature increases and a shortening of precipitation cycles with extreme weather events more likely. We've all experienced those extreme weather events in the past month. 
Um, higher temperatures and more developed land result in less water being absorbed into the ground to replenish the groundwater. And I'm sure you all recall the summer of 2016. It was the driest summer in record in Massachusetts, and precipitation levels were at least 6.5 inches below average, and the drought that resulted from that lack of rainwater uh, persisted for months. So um, big picture, where, does, where do Commonwealth residents get their water? 65% of Commonwealth residents get their water from the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, from the Quabbin and the Wachusett Reservoirs. Another 25% get their water from municipal, district, or commercial water systems. And the remaining 10%, and that's most of Dover, get their water from private wells. So it's important to note that that 10% is easy for the state to ignore. And I'll explain what I mean in a minute, but that's the reason why we as a community need to be vigilant on the local level. So basic science here, and I'm not a scientist, so I'll do my best, but what is an aquifer? An aquifer is the underground layer of permeable rock that bears water. The layer can be made of rock with fractures in it or also from unconsolidated materials like gravel, sand, or silt. And from this, groundwater can be extracted using a well. So Dover's, Dover lies, um, well, two, two aquifers actually lie under Dover, the Charles River Aquifer and the Neponset River Aquifer. So every well in Dover, whether it's a large well servicing one of the public water suppliers or a residential well on private property draw from these two aquifers. Next slide. And so where do Dover residents get their water? Four percent of Dover residents get their water from municipal water supplies in Walpole and Natick. The remaining 96 percent of Dover residents are drawing water from the two aquifers, whether that water is coming from the public water supplier or a private well. And of that 96%, 68.5% uh, of Dover residents are on private wells, 28.7% get their water from the Colonial Water Company, and 2.9% get their water from the other two public water suppliers, which happen to be not-for-profit trusts, the Springdale Farms Trust and the Old Farm Trust. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, the regulation of public water suppliers. So a public water supplier is a for-profit company that is regulated by DEP, but it's important to note that regulation really does not happen due to DEP's limited staffing and budget constraints. This is something that we've learned over the past um, nine months of studying this issue, and it's really come as a bit of a surprise to us. So as a result, um, there are water conservation measures mandated in the permits of these public water suppliers that are not enforced or even monitored for compliance. Withdrawals above permitted limits that occur regularly and they are not addressed and DEP takes no action. Um, the customer base for Dover's public water suppliers continues to expand without any review or analysis by any authority, local or state, uh, or regard to implications to the water supply. And of course, for-profit water suppliers make more money when they sell more water. So we've talked to DEP about our concerns. We've had multiple conversations, and they've stated that while they concur that the committee's concerns are legitimate, um, they can't act until Dover provides scientific documentation that groundwater is at risk, either because of extreme withdrawals, growth of distribution systems, or other development. So I'm going to conclude this portion by telling you the top five reasons why we believe the hydrology study should be funded. Number one, there is anecdotal evidence in the form of dry wells and disappearing streams that there may be a developing groundwater shortage in Dover. And I want to stress maybe. We simply don't know, which is why we're interested in gathering data and doing analysis. Two, availability of groundwater is critical to our ability to get water from our wells as well as protecting property values. It goes without saying that when a residential well runs dry, it's expensive to redrill a new well, and it's also 
really stressful on the homeowners. Three, understanding Dover's groundwater situation will allow town boards and commissions to better assess and regulate new development proposals. Four, without professional scientific data and analysis, we cannot enlist DEP's enforcement authority to address excessive withdrawals. And five, we want to be proactive in light of recently enacted regulations. In 2018, in fact, there, was, there is a state regulation about the installation of new sprinkler systems, and we anticipate that DEP will enact further regulations in the future to address the issues, issue of water usage and conservation. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Ron Myrick. Ron is, a, as I mentioned, a committee member. He's a Massachusetts licensed site professional and an environmental engineer. He is also a director at the environmental consulting firm Tetra Tech. Um, Ron developed the scope of work for the hydrology study, and I have to say we should all be grateful to Ron for doing this on our behalf, um, because just by developing this scope, he provided the town services of about $5,000, and he's already given us a big leg up on this um, portion of the project. So, Ron. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. So, um, next slide, please. So, to do the hydrology study, we talked about how we want to gather the data, evaluate the data, and come up with a way to collect our data. So the first step here, it's called a, generate a graphical information system, GIS map, of private public wells for reference by Dover's departments, boards, committees, and the public. So a GIS map, we actually have one in this town. It's, uh, it's sparsely populated with information that was provided by MassDEP, but it has huge capabilities and a lot of towns use it for uh, various uses from public works. Uh, and this could be a springboard for using this GIS map for other uh, purposes, but for this purpose is to collect and manage the data that we collect as part of the study. So as stated there, public and private wells would all be located on here and uh, give us a good backbone structure for moving forward. The next task would be installing 15 to 20 new groundwater monitoring wells. There's currently only one well behind the Carroll uh, Community Center that is, uh, gives us one little spot location, what happens with groundwater over time in that particular area, but is no, by no means uh, sufficient for coverage across the whole town. So 15 to 20 new groundwater monitoring wells, two inch diameter wells, about 50 feet deep at various locations around the town. These will allow us to continuously measure elevation and track changes in groundwater elevation over time. That first item will be done with this little device. It's called a pressure transducer. It's suspended down at the bottom of the well. It'll run for four, five, six years, and it will continuously collect data for the amount of water that's above it. It can measure every minute, every week, every month. We would probably be somewhere in between three to four days, so it would capture rainwater, precipitation changes, and what happens to the groundwater in that particular location around the well uh, after those as such events occur. We would also, and this is also important, is sample these wells. 20 wells across the town give us an understanding of if we have contamination issues. Uh, MassDEP recently enacted some recommendations for what they want to see sampled in new water supplies. That will be the, less, the list of uh, analytes that we will be looking for. Next slide. So what this would, provide, what this would approach is looking at areas where we have problematic well yields. What does that mean? So if, if your neighbor puts a well in, you put a well in, you have to go deeper, you're having trouble, your well driller keeps tacking another $10,000 onto your, uh, your bill to get your well in, well that's problematic well yields. So we will be targeting where the Board of Health has information about that occurring. Obviously more dense development presents issues for water supply. If you have more wells drawing from the same location, you have more likelihood of, a, of an issue in those areas. Where we have public water supply wells, again, you're drawing a lot of water from a limited area, more likely you could have issues where you're uh, depleting the available water in that area. And we thought it was also important as part of this study is to look at historic releases. We all know that in this area there was a release at the mobile station a couple of decades ago 
And this study would also look at if we have issues in downtown and in the other well location areas uh, associated with contamination. So all this data can be used to generate an expert review and opinion of our water. What conditions exist, what we need to look at now, but most importantly, what we have to look at going forward. Uh, I'm not going to say right now that we have a water problem, but we don't have any data to say we do or don't, and we don't know what's going to happen over time, and that's the whole purpose of this study. So the last bullet here is provide the data that can be used to inform future decision making. Next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of the estimate for doing the hydrology study. So the first is researching the pile existing data. So there is information out there that's been generated over the last two to three decades. Uh, various studies of where water uh, is more abundant. Uh, there's no reason to not use that information. So there's, there's a task there to compile available information in Board of Health records. And, and other studies. Then this, uh, that, that, that's about an $8,000 to $10,000 item. Developing the GIS layer is, an, is a significant cost. It includes also purchasing GPS equipment so we can get sub-meter accuracy of all the wells that we do measure. Uh, but it's a significant investment in, in, uh, in using a resource that's phenomenally powerful for tracking data and that's GIS, and we have one in the town. If you go to any of the larger towns around us, they're all using this to, uh, uh, to really understand their situations. So that investment, uh, we estimated about 29,000 to 33,000. Installing the wells, fairly straightforward, two inch diameter wells, probably looking at a cost between 25,500 and 33,000, I think that's us. Uh, testing the wells, excuse me? Uh, $25,500 to $33,000 for the installing the wells. Total 15 to 20. 15 to 20 wells. That's not per well. These, are, these aren't wells you would be using to draw for your water supply at a home. This is a small diameter test well. Its purpose is just that. And monitor and test the groundwater. So the total cost for that would be for the first year, we'd probably be checking these pressure transducers several times. And, and I say we, I'm not doing this, somebody else is. I'll be involved from the perspective of watching them do it and overseeing the, the town's interest that is being done right, but my firm and myself will not be doing this. This is something that, that uh, I made clear at the very beginning of this. So monitor and test the groundwater. We're looking at a cost between 37000 and 45000 for the first year. And that includes purchasing these transducers. And then finally, the report preparation for the first year, we're estimated a cost of $25,500 to $29,000. So that's taking all this data, compiling a report with recommendations on how to move forward. And the next slide talks about moving forward. This is not a one and done study. Um, Next slide, please. Probably looking at a cost between $10,000 and $20,000 a year to continue to monitor going forward. The infrastructure will be in place, and we'll want to follow the trends and see what's happening over time. This cost would include supporting continued monitoring of the groundwater elevations, targeted groundwater sampling in those areas where we think it's needed, updating the GIS water layer, and preparing an annual report. So, final slide, please. We can go back to that. The installation of the 15 wells is 25 to 33,000 total. Please hold questions till the end of the the end of the presentation, please. I've just Thank got you. one last slide. Thank you. Whoop. No, oh, back up, please. Thank you. So what if Dover does not approve funding of the hydrology study? What do we lose? We lose the ability to evaluate the impact to existing residents of new developments that seek to draw water from existing public water supplies. We will not be able to request DEP to enforce existing water conservation measures in public water supply permits and regulate withdrawals that exceed permitted levels. 
We will not be able to assess the impacts of environmental contamination from hazardous substance releases, and we will not be able to respond proactively to pending state legislative initiatives that may force Massachusetts communities to address water conservation. So just in sum, Dover is unusual in because our water is not coming from an MWRI reservoir in central Massachusetts, but from a resource that is directly beneath us. And so we calculated that for less than $75 per household this year, and less than $10 per year in subsequent years, the funding of a water monitoring infrastructure, which is what we will be acquiring, and the hydrology study will allow us to understand this irreplaceable resource that merits our attention and protection. So thank you for your consideration. Questions? I, I'm sorry, sir. Would you please come up to the microphone? And please state your name and address. Thank you. Uh, John Kuby, 11 Stagecoach. Um, what was the total cost, uh, you know, soup to nuts with everything involved for the, for the entire monitoring system and the drilling? and So the, the entire budget, 125000 150000 Okay. For the five tasks for the first year. Okay, so that's for the first year. Now, is it possible to just use private wells for your monitoring systems and that way we could eliminate the, uh, the cost of drilling the wells? No, because you're dealing with someone's water supply and putting instruments and... In, in, you don't want to mess with people's water supplies directly by putting, to disturb them in any way. Okay, so even if that's an irrigation system only, you can't use that? Sure, it could be considered if that's the purpose of the right. well. Okay. Um, and what about just, you know, implementing the restrictions on the sprinkler systems beforehand, and that way we would know that, you know, it, it was, the aquifer was staying steady, um, you know, we could... Well, that's applying a solution before knowing the problem. So if there's a problem, the study tells you if there's a problem. I don't think people want to know that they have to curtail their irrigation if there's not a reason to. It's always a good thing to, to conserve, but, right. but all, I would rather... All, all the critics and, you know, people with, uh, with the studies that they do about, you know, environmental uh, protection and, you know, that the world's going to end because of global warming. Um, isn't that kind of obvious that we need to curtail the sprinkling a little bit? It's not my place to say. I know, it's not what, your place to what, say it. And I apologize. That, no, that's... But no, I, I'm just trying to save taken. a few bucks. No, but... I, what's that? I'm just trying to save a few bucks. Well, I, I think... I, your point's taken, okay? It, it would save bucks to not have the information but information cost bucks. So, no, no, yeah, I, and I agree with you, it's good to know, but you know, it, like on private wells where they're irrigation only would seem like a better solution to drop these things into because there's nobody drinking out of it. Well, one of the things we're trying to do is target the areas that make sense. So you're still throwing good money at maybe not the best place to be targeting. So the areas we want to target are the areas where we believe there might be problems, not just scattered wherever available. I mean, it may be that we can use an irrigation well and save the installation cost, but the actual drilling cost isn't that much. The uh, drilling expenses is about fifteen dollars to $20,000, so less than $1,000 a well. Right. And then uh, the GPS system, it, you know, you have a water meter guy go around. Couldn't you just have him read the the things when he goes out in a monthly thing rather than dumping that we, money into yeah. a GPS system? I don't know that we have the infrastructure in town right now to do the type of GPS work that would be useful here. It's, that's about a $3,000 investment to get sub-meter accuracy uh, and has huge benefits to the Board of Health later when they're going to observe a septic system installation and they can hit a button and the D-box is located. I don't know if anyone's had tried to find their D-box 30 years after <laughs> it was put yeah. installed, but again, there's other uses for this information. This is all under the Board of Health, so there'll be some, some rise up in technology usage from this study alone. Yeah. Okay, I was just sure. curious.
Tom Crowley, Cedar Hill Road. Can you tell us now where the 15 to 20 wells are going to be drilled? No. <laughs> that would be, we, I, I've identified a few areas that I thought would be targeted, uh, but until we take a look at the available data and do some evaluation interviews and really look into this. Do you anticipate drilling on private property? No. Okay. Do you anticipate drilling on colonial water system property? If that's, is that private property? Publicly owned water company. Uh, I don't know. You don't know colonial water? Well, I know colonial water. I don't know if it's an entity. Well, they that serve 40%, well, yeah, yeah, I, they I, serve 40 of the town. Right. I don't know. Privately if, owned public water supply. I don't know if their wells are privately owned. So. Yes, they are by them, predominantly. Okay. Then if it's privately owned property, then we would not be seeking to drill on their property at this time. And that's 40 percent of the users in town. So we won't get any information. Well, you don't need to that. be right at the location. Is there a road going by the wells? That's Do you have any idea where you're going to drill at this point? We have a general idea where we're going to drill. Well, why don't you tell us? That would be helpful. Okay. And you might bring it to I, town I think I've meeting. given enough information about where we, there's still, that whole first task is to answer your question. Research and compile the, compile the existing data. Is that where? What I'm asking is, you know, specifically where are you going to drill? What's it, well, yeah, you know, there are characteristics of the type of places that make sense to put wells. Where they will go specifically is Can the task. Can you tell us at town meeting where that will be? The task of the hydrologist that we hire to do the study will identify the specific locations of the wells. At town meeting? No, we won't have hired well, him at town you know, meeting. The point is you're going to ask for 150000 bucks. We ought to know where you're going to drill. And obviously, you, you just said you're not going to drill on 40% of the town that's provided well, water by Colonial Water Company. The, the idea of the study is to get coverage across the whole town. Either in some component of that is geographic, and some of it is by land type, land use, density. All that needs to be evaluated. I put a lot of time into this so far. I haven't put in all the time to go through all that to identify every okay. well. That's part of the study. Would you let me suggest that you look into the area that is supplied by Colonial Water Company I, geographically? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the, I got another question. Have you have you looked at Elm Bank in terms of providing water to the town of Dover? We. We have a pretty good understanding of the situation with Elm Bank. Um, the infrastructure for serving the town from Elm Bank obviously doesn't exist for most of Dover. Colonial water co covers a substantial territory in Dover. Elm Bank is over in the Charles River. Correct. I live right near Needham Natick, and we can get a third of whatever can be pumped out of there. All we need to do is run a line there, which we tried to do about seven or eight, nine years ago. And it was uh, under a million bucks, probably 700,000. We already have a, a 10 inch well, 10 inch pipe that goes from the Episcopal Church down to Springdale and Main Street. So, I mean, you ought to look into that as a potential supply of water. Well, Mr. Crowley, we're at the beginning stages of this. Our job here is not to do the work now to present. It's to see if the town wants to do this. No, that's fine. I understand that. But I think you ought to be aware of what the potential supply is in town. There's water all over Dover. The question is getting it to the people that live in Dover. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Uh, Craig Hughes, Tree Hughes Lane. Um, just, just a couple of budget, budget items. Um, whose budget will this, moving forward, the appropriations? I believe there will be an appropriation each year now as part of a budget. Whose budget will this fall under? The, the after this year, assuming this is funded? Correct. I believe Board of Health. 
Okay. And will that require some more man hours to oversee this each year, or somebody has to fall too every year? Is that the correct? Correct. There'll be some effort to manage this going forward. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on to Article 13, Amendment of the Demolition Review Bylaw. Hi, everybody. My name is Richard Eels. I live at 109 Farm Street, and I've been on the Dover Historical Commission almost 30 years. Um, can I have the first slide? I want to just tell you briefly the kind of things that we've been doing before I tell you what we want to do. Um, this is the Colonel Paul Wentworth House. Uh, it was built in 1701. That's a drawing. And it was originally in uh, Rollinsford, New Hampshire. And in 1936, uh, a, m a member of that family of Paul, the Wentworths are the leading family in New Hampshire, governors, generals, etc. cetera. Um, and Paul Wentworth was in that family. Uh, and in 1936, that house was purchased by, and um, moved to Dover. Uh, as the house was being demolished and taken apart, the Works Progress Administration, uh, 1936 37 documented the removal of that house to Dover. They numbered and labeled every stick that they took apart, and that house was moved to Claybrook, um, Claybrook Road. Next slide. And there it is, it's a little dark, but there, there it is as it was on Claybrook uh, at 21 uh, Claybrook Road. Uh, and it, it was there for from 37 to 2002 when the property was purchased by Ken Rendell. And Ken didn't really know what he had. He had an old house and he wanted to tear down to build his new house. But when we did some research, um, and we were able to do that because we knew the house was old and we were able to impose a one-year delay on the demolition, which was according to the bylaw. And this was not opposed by Mr. Rendell once he learned what he had. Um, and so in 2002, uh, rather than demolishing that house with a, <clears throat> a big ball, the house was again taken apart, stick by stick, and stored. And the state of New Hampshire and the residents of New Hampshire, uh, they raised something like $300,000 to, to take that apart and to store it and then to reassemble it. Next slide. And there it is, reassembled back very close to where it was originally in Rollinsbury, New Hampshire. And it, um, they, were very, they were very proud. They were very glad that, the, that Dover could not demolish that house and, and that historic house, which is very important to the state of New Hampshire, which is why the state of New Hampshire actually gave like almost $200,000 uh, to preserve it. Next slide, please. And now they're using it as an historical. They're, um, they're running. Uh, you know, historical um, tours of the house, and you can see it's a little dark, but the, you know, the inside paneling is what's really, really incredible on these really old houses. So that's kind of the biggest success that we've had in terms of um, putting a delay on a house and then finding a place for it. Um, a couple more next. Uh, this is the Fisher Barn um, being reassembled over at the Carroll House. That was originally up on Center Street, and uh, with the cooperation of the owners, uh, that house was, that barn was taken apart stick by stick and stored for several years and then uh, reassembled and you can see the sticks going up and, and again when that house was taken apart there, every stick was labeled and that, that barn is now on the Carroll House property that we took up. Next slide please. Um, anybody know what that is? Aha, you got to observe it as you think. That's a 1770 house that was supposed to be demolished. And uh, we were looking around for what might, what, what could we do with that house? 1770s, a very old and valuable house. A lot of our ancestors took axes and saws and made that house. Um, next slide, please. And there it is, sited on Walpole. It's behind um, 
uh, the family of Leo Boyle, who took the house and moved it across the street and put it behind his house, and he made it into a playhouse for his children. So that house was able to be saved, 1770. Next slide. This is, of course, our biggest failure. Um, that's uh, the house at 6 Farm Street, uh, formerly owned by Teddy Bag. Uh, and we tried to work with the new owner of that house to save it. At one point, we had deals that he was going to give it to the town if we could raise a certain amount of money. And in the end, he backed out of everything. And that house is now destroyed. That was the oldest house in Dover that was built in Dover. And that house is gone. Next slide. Uh, you can't see it very well, but this is an example of a house that we decided we, we could not save uh, at 52 Farm Street. That house is now gone. It's an example of one of the houses that we decided was not savable, and we let it go. Um, over 90, 95 percent of the, of the demolition permits that come to us, we say we can't stop it. It's, it's only if the house has got, you know, extraordinary historical relevance and we think it's in a condition that somebody might be interested in that we can save it. Next, next slide, please. Uh, here's another one that was demolished in 2007, uh, 12 Center Street. Uh, looks like a nice house, but sometimes they are not savable after we go and visit them. Uh, next slide. And here's 50 Willow Street that used to be there. That's another old house that is no longer... Uh, in Dover. It might be the last one. Next slide. Okay, that was it. So those are examples of the kind of houses that we've been able to save and do something about, and the large majority of houses that we're not able to save and don't really intend to save. In, in some ways, we're involved in triage. <laughs> These houses come before us, and most of them, we say, are not historically significant. So our bylaw, and I didn't I think you could see it if I, if I made a slide to post it up there. We want to make two changes in the bylaw. The bylaw as it now stands applies to any house built before 1929. And that law was passed in 97, so that's a while ago. And if we're going to keep up to date, uh, we'd have to come back to the town every few years to, to change that date. And the Mass Historical Commission is now recommending not a fixed date for towns, but a date that we're proposing, which is that the bylaw would apply to any houses that are 50 years older or more. And that 50-year number is consistent with the bylaw in Medfield and the bylaw in Natick. So we're in, we would be in line with our neighbors. Um, so that's the first change we want to make. And the second change is just a procedural one. Right now, when we get an application, we have 21 days to get back to the building inspector as to whether we want to, um, over, want to review that house. And we want to change that down from 21 days to 10 days because it was pointed out to us that if we're not going to do anything with the house, why, we, why should we take 21 days? It might impede a developer or somebody who wants to you know, demolish a house that we don't think is savable. So those are the two changes. One to go from a fixed date of 1929 to a rolling date of 50 years or older. And secondly, to, uh, to reduce the timeline that we have to get back to the building inspector so that things can move more smoothly. So those are the two, those are the two parts of the bylaw that we're hoping to change. Questions? I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir, you have to come up to, thank you. Richard, Mark Howe, 54 Farm Street, how are you? Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, your intentions and the commission's intentions are great, and I agree that a 100-year-old house or a house um, that has historic um, deed to it should be preserved. Um, Six Farm Street, Craig and I, had committed over th or about $30,000 in services to help relocate that, and it unfortunately didn't pan out. Where I'm going with this is the 50 to 100 year, I don't see a significant um, houses with any significant historical uh, features to them. Um, I've got just a couple of, on MLS last year, these are approximate numbers, there were 45 houses sold in uh, Dover. 17 homes were built in the 50s, and 16 homes were built in the 60s. 
73% of the homes sold were built between 1950 and 67. I don't, do you have? What's some, your question? Well, do you have some reference of houses that would be saved in that time frame? And who has the qualifications to determine what's historical? Well, right now that determination is, is vested in the Dover Historical Commission. And what, how are they qualified? We're appointed by the selectmen. No, how, what are the credentials besides appointment? I, I could come in. If you, if you volunteered and the selectmen appointed you, but who's, you, you who's could be on. Who's qualified to, to determine what's historical? We are. I know. That's our job. How do you do it? Do you have training? Do you have experience? Well, we, we first look at the age of the house. If the, if, uh, under the current bylaw, if the house was built before nine, after 1929, we have to pass on it and let, the, let it go forward. And otherwise, we, we go and visit the house, we examine the construction, we try to find the date of, of, of construction, whether there's anything special about the house in terms of building of construction, you know, location, prior owners. Clearly, the Six Farm Street house, merely by the province of it being the oldest house in Dover, now, when we moved from 1929 to a rolling 50, 95% of the houses, we're going to just say, yeah, no, no problem. But there may be houses that are worth looking at and trying to save that are, that are in that new, new range. It won't be very many. I feel it puts a burden on everybody. The majority of, of us have houses in that time frame. Yeah. But I go back to who, how are you qualified or committee members to determine what is of historical significance? Who's got the educational background? Well, up until now, all we've done is try to save houses that nobody doesn't think should be saved. I mean, everybody thought that six farm streets should have been saved. The fact that we saved the barn, the fact that we saved the one on, on Claybrook. We're not talking about your average house. We're talking about a house that is for some reason special. One, 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 that I, one example that I can give you that would be under the new bylaw that isn't under the old is, for example, Miss Peabody's art studio um, in the, on her property there. That, that is probably, you know, a Bauhaus design, and we might want to look at that very carefully. Right now, with the bylaw we have, we can't even go in and look at it and try to save it somehow if it's, if it's scheduled for destruction. So we're really only talking about some special houses. So everybody, or the majority of the people in this room would have to go to your committee to get permission for the transfer of the sale of their house? No. You would you no, no, no. You guys would have to sign off on no. it? No. Only if you want to demolish the house. Well, the, it's a I'm demolition sorry. review bylaw. If you come to the building inspector and say, I want to demolish right now a 1925 house, mm -hmm. the building inspector is going to send that, that that request to the Historical Commission, and we will look at it. I apologize. That's what I meant. Any, any of us that want to demolish our house. Yeah, and there aren't that many demolitions. It's not like everybody is going to demolish their house. But if somebody wants to do a, a demolition, we want to make sure that it's not a midnight demolition and the town has no input into whether that's appropriate or not in terms of whether it'll change the character of the town by not being there. I would maintain that that house on Six Farm changed the character of Farm Street when it was gone. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Oops. Yep. One. Hi, Rich Forte, 35 Old Farm Road. Is it going to have anything to do with if you, if you want to do rehab, renovation, that type of stuff? Is it purely just demolition? It has nothing to do with demolition, no. We have no input on that at all. So if you want to sit there and refurbish your 1938 house and make all sorts of changes, this law won't impact that at all? Uh, no, we have no input. Thank you. It's only demolition. The destruction of our property. Actually, sir, Mr. Long's going to go first, then you. Thank you. This looks like a real example. Oh, Charles Long, uh, 121 Walpole Street. This looks like a real example of regulatory creep here. Uh, I was at the town meeting in, uh, when this uh, subject was taken up before, and I didn't speak then. I was tempted to get up and say that this was really unnecessary. Uh, 
Dover is probably one of the least historic towns in all of New England. Uh, it's, there's a scattering, a scattering of pre-1900 houses here, just a small scattering. Uh, many of them were really not very important or very desirable houses. They've been torn down or fallen down over the years. We do have a small number of pre-1900 houses that are kind of nice, kind of nice to have around. But we don't have a historic district like Dedham does or something like that. So it's kind of nice to try to do something. Uh, on the other hand, moving it up so you're talking anything less than 50 years old, this goes back to the great development era of Dover in the 60s. You're starting to come into an enormous number of houses now. I don't know what we're talking about in any historic sense that people regard as historic. Uh, this is really just regulatory creep here, and I don't think we need to do it at all. I don't think we should have moved from 99 to 29, and I don't think we should go with this rule either. John Kuby, 11 Stagecoach. Um, yeah, the, the roll in 50 sounds kind of bizarre because, like, like was just stated, there were so many houses built in the 60s, and there's really no significance. And on top of that, there's asbestos and lead paint involved. Um, and then you said it's just with total demo with, with the house. So if you want to demo, like, you know, the back wing of it, no, and just the whole house. So, so if you go in and demo the back wing, you can make it modern, and it doesn't matter. You can make it out of gingerbread. Okay, so it can be a gingerbread house, and it won't matter to the historic part of it. Okay. And there, is there any restriction within the town where you have a, a more of a historic society in town than you do, you know, outside the town limits? I don't understand your question. Okay, the downtown area, is there a, more of a historic, you know, no part of the town is treated any differently than any other part. Okay, so it's, it's all the same. Yeah. It okay. depends on where it is and what it's, how old it is. Right. And whether it's worth saving and whether it's possible to save it. I mean, things that we might think are worth saving are not always possible to save. Well, yeah. And I, we're not going to stand in anybody's way if there's no chance right. of it doing it. It could be anything. termite infested or something like that, yeah. Pardon? I said it could be termite infested and it wouldn't be worth you know, tearing it apart and trying to save oh, it. We've, we've looked at houses that have been empty for five years and they're run down and everything's all, you know, moldy and stuff. There's no chance. So, right. sure, tear it down. Yeah. I mean, as I say, we, we approve without any hearing or anything over 95% of the ones that come before us. Right. I'm, I'm just we more are for, not an impediment. I'm just more for a sp specific date and then that, that back rather than a roll in 50. Well, I, we, I mean, I don't want to have to come before a town meeting every five years and change the date, one thing. And the second is it's now to be consistent with our neighbors, Medfield and Natick, who have passed um, also by also that, that date, 50 years. Right, but It should be known that we have the possibility, we can only impose a one-year delay. Some towns have the possibility of a two-year delay. Right, but I mean, it just sounds like if Medfield builds, you know, a high-rise building, and now we got to build the high-rise building. It just, it's, it's not, in, you know, we don't need to keep No, it's the step. opposite. If you can't tear down a, a valuable old house in Medfield, it shouldn't be able to tear down a similar one in Dover. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, I live in an 1844 house. If you think it doesn't apply to me, and I'm just woofing. Uh, my name's Craig Rafter. I probably knocked down most of the homes in this town. So I probably could be on the other side of the fence with you. Probably have been. Uh, but I have to ask you a real basic, simple question. Can you tell me, you mentioned Amelia Peabody's house. That's over 50 years old. Is there one structure? I'm talking about the, apparently Just the, give me a chance here. Then okay, you, is there one structure that's 50 years old that you want to save? That's my only question. You can fire it right back at me. I mentioned Miss Peabody's art studio. That's old, over 50 years old. Not as far as we know. We're well, not talking I about the tell, house. I'm talking right about the it, art studio. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that's the kind of a house I'm talking about. I have not had a chance to look at all the houses 
from then Let's on. assume you're right, which I would, which I'm quite sure you're wrong. Is there another one? I don't know. Okay. Thank you. And if it comes before the commission, we'll look at it. Steve Kruskal, Nine Rieger Road, and Chair of the Historical Commission. There are a handful of homes in Dover that are built after 1929, but 50 years or older, that are worth preserving. Of the vast majority of the 700 or so homes that were built after 1929, again, 50 years or older, are not in that category. The one example I would point to in terms of the quality of the home is Henry Stone's home on 97th Center, is it? Where the family recognized the historical nature of the home and invested in restoring it to the point where now it's lived in. That house was at risk of being demolished. There are a few other homes in Dover similar to that, homes that were pioneers in the solar era, homes that are built after the style of Richard Neutra, who is acknowledged as a master architect of the 1940s and 50s in the U.S. But that number is so small that the likelihood of anyone's individual home coming under our jurisdiction and our putting a hold on that demolition is remote. I didn't hear a question, but I agree, Steve. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to Article 14, amending the bylaw to ban the use of commercial, uh, the commercial use of plastic bags in the town of Dover. I'm Annabelle Bush and I'm Avery Blake and we're seniors at Dover Sherburne High School. Today we'd like to talk to you about the potential plastic bag ban that we'd like to introduce. We're, we're going to go over a very, um, uh, a list that varies of reasons as to why we'd like to do it. Um, they range from the detriment to wildlife, the environment, and their economic costs. Um, having grown up in Dover, we feel that lucky to live in such a beautiful town and we want to preserve that beauty as well as um, uh, make the consumers and the people aware of their habits and the effect that they have on the environment. In this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see there is a plastic bag in the tree and that's, that was taken a little over two weeks ago in the center of town. And we just want to show that it does affect um, Dover. As we all know, the best um, practice in terms of the environments is reuse, re reduce, reuse, and recycle, and we want to just keep bring these principles to mind. Um, we're going to go over a few quick facts. We're only going to go over two of them. Um, on average, a plastic bag is only used for 12 minutes, but it takes 500 to 1,000 years to actually decompose. Um, One million plastic bags are produced per minute, and 50% of them are used only once. Next slide. Um, 30 countries, the latest being Kenya, have banned or restricted plastic bags. 61 towns in Massachusetts, um, including our neighbors, Wellesley, Natick, and recently Needham. Um, we know there is pending legislation in Massachusetts in the state legislature, but if the uh, similar bills have been proposed like this and they haven't been passed, and also if this is voted and is passed right now, it wouldn't be um, in procedure until August of 2019, so we're just trying to get ahead of this and um, make the transition easier for businesses in Dover. We are such a small town and we do have the capability to um, introduce this ban, so why don't we now, if we can? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects it has on animals. Uh, a lot of people hear about the marine life and specifically. Um, oftentimes plastic bags result in entanglement and the, the fish or marine life can't 
will eventually die from starvation because it can't defend itself. Um, as well, a common problem is ingestion. When a fish ingests it, it makes them feel full, so they don't want to eat, so they don't, and they eventually will starve. As well, the, a few chemicals used in the production of plastic can neg negatively affect our endocrine, endocrine system and hormones. So that can end up on our plate as a result of the food, ch food chain. Um, as well as 94% of American well water is found to have plastic remnants in it, just to show that it does end up on our plate and affect every one of us. Um, as you can see, this is a clear example that plastic bags clearly mimic jellyfish. And this is one of the most common examples people tend to hear. It's clear that a, a turtle can mistake um, plastic bags for jellyfish, which is a, a huge source of their um, diet. Okay, um, so we know that plastic bags are bad for the environment, but to put that in perspective, um, it's projected in 2050 that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Next slide. Um, as well, we'd like to talk about and adjust uh, paper versus plastic. We are not encouraging the use of paper because it actually is proved that Paper, when it decomposes, does emit more CO2 emissions, but when it's um, recycled properly, it doesn't. As well, 77% of the material used when making paper bags is reused, so there is a clear cycle of um, reuse and it is more cost effective. As well, when we're talking about plastic, they do emit less CO2 emissions, um, but they do actually never fully degrade. Um, when they're and they only emit less CO2 emissions when they're disposed of properly, and less than 5%, which is roughly 1 in 20 plastic bags, are recycled properly. Um, so according to the Clean Air Council, it costs $4,000 to recycle one ton of plastic bags, while the recycled product is only worth $32. So um, also, um, plastic bags often get um, in, uh, like, Stuck in, machines. stuck in machines, and it costs uh, over $5,000 to repair, so this is just a process that's harmful to our recycling committee. Um, as well, we went around and talked to the four Dover businesses that would be affected by this. There was a general understanding and support for it, but the uh, businesses did acknowledge economic challenges. Um, the Dover market, for example, has already taken measures to reduce um, plastic consumption or plastic bag uh, consumption by 30% by just asking customers whether they would like a bag or not. Um, in general, um, the Dover Deli was the only group that did not fully support it. They understood our argument, but it's just harder for them because they do have a lot of construction workers coming in and that need to take their food out quickly. Um, in general, we'd like to encourage reusable bags instead of plastic bags. Um, currently, we're trying to find donors for potential um, funds to buy reusable bags, and another option that for which would make the transition for the businesses a lot easier. Um, as well, another option is biodegradable bags, which cost 15 cents roughly per bag, while plastic bags cost two to five cents. So it is a little bit more expensive, but in general, it would positively affect not only the natural beauty of the, the town, but it would help the environment and animals. Thank you. Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions? <laughs> so now we're going to move on to Article 15, which is borrowing for Carroll Community Center improvements. That is a very tough act to follow. 
Article 15, this is the rest of the improvements that we were talking about for the maintenance project for Carroll Community Center. Um, this is the culmination of probably 17 years of maintenance projects that have been done for the Carroll Community Center to keep it open and usable. And so what we have come to is the boilers we're going to presume are going to be replaced. The additional improvements are the controls, as Mrs. Lisbon brought up, the controls that will improve the ventilation and manage the temperature better throughout the building. Um, and then we will also have some electrical upgrades. We'll have improvements in the hallway. And we will have improvements for the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA um, modifications to the building. Many of you know that. Um, from the back entrance, there are stairways, it's a very difficult entrance. There are aspects, there are parts of that building that our seniors do not have access to because the building is not fully compliant with a, an up to code with ADA. So it's a very important part that we would want to do. Next slide. Thank you, Bill. Again, thank you. Good? Good, so let me talk a little bit about the tax impact. The estimated project would be 3.4 million if performed as one integrated project. If we were to come to you and propose doing first one part, then another part, and then another part, the price actually goes up an additional million dollars. So the value is in getting all these, rest of these projects put in together, single integrated project. The tax impact is based on the median single family home value of $932,250 in Dover. And so the borrowing cost would be at 4.25% interest for the median home. The first year, your taxes would go up $72.56. The highest year would be an increase of $130.27, and the last year it would drop down to $67.61. That is for the rest of the renovation that has been talked about and planned for since way back in 2002. Next slide, please. We will continue to monitor Masonry repairs, that's a part of just exactly as we do with our homes. Masonry repairs, the timbers, the use related improvements would be perhaps specific to programs, would be specific to um, the needs of various programs. The window system and also ongoing maintenance for the septic system. Next slide. But the really big point to understand is that there are no further major infrastructure improvements anticipated for this project. This is the last major project that we can foresee for the next 20 years. Are there any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Okay. We will now move on to Article 17, update on the 2011 Open Space and Recreation Plan. A, yeah, come on up. Uh, Amy Moot, 10 Glen Street, and the chair of the Open Space Committee. Um, the state requires us to revise the open space plan every five to seven years. Um, and while we rarely ever apply for any state grants, which is really why you absolutely have to have an up-to-date plan, it, it's good discipline to, for us to ensure that we have an updated plan. Um, since our land and our rural feel is our key aspects to our identity here in Dover, um, this really sort of represents the long-term plan uh, for the town. 
So uh, we're asking for $10,000 to update the plan. Uh, we're hoping to spend less on, on it. We're uh, looking into some options to, um, to do that, but at the, at the moment that's what the consultant quote says it's going to take to, uh, to do it. Any questions? Questions? Thank you. Thanks. Moving on to Article 18, Borrowing Logistics Information. Can I speak to you? Okay. When the town goes out to borrow money, part of the bid responses is called a premium. It's an upfront cash payment that is made to the town to lower its true interest cost. Up until recently, that premium was used without further vote by the town to pay interest expenses. With the recent change in the law, now that premium has to be actually appropriated to reduce the actual debt to be issued instead of paying off the interest. This authorization would permit that to happen. Any questions? Okay. Moving on to Article 21, revision of the bylaw for wireless communication updates. Hi, I'm Mark Saro, uh, Colonial Road and Planning Board Chair. Uh, I had some comments and some slides, but I'm going to keep it brief given the hour. The Planning Board has a public hearing on this particular article next Monday night, so a week from tonight. So for the benefit of the Warrant Committee members especially, I'm going to go through this very briefly, but for anyone that wants more detail than I'll go through tonight, I'll either answer your questions or um, certainly come to the public hearing a week from tonight. So uh, as, as you may recall, the Planning Board for the last several years has um, generally brought an article each year that would be an update or a cleanup to part of the zoning bylaws just to keep the bylaws current and it's always based on our experience implementing the bylaws based on the applications we see coming to the board. Uh, two years ago that was site plan review updates, last year that was the sign bylaw, this year it's the wireless communications bylaw. Uh, the bylaw is, uh, you can move through the slides Bill, thanks. Um, so the bylaw is um, one where the planning board can't actually prohibit uh, uh, wireless communication facilities from being installed in town. Federal law uh, limits the uh, local ability to restrict wireless facilities, but we can regulate them. And that's what this bylaw does. It gives, it gives the town the ability through special permit process and site plan review to um, get details on proposals that come to the town for wireless facilities and to condition them and to really understand what they're about and be sure that, that uh, proposals uh, do not um, reduce property values or otherwise have aesthetic or other implications that would be negative for the town. That's, that's what the bylaw does and that's the planning board's role in the process. Um, the bylaw that's currently on the books has been on, it's the original bylaw that was adopted 20 years ago, it hasn't changed at all since then and uh, wireless technology has changed a lot since then, as we know. So um, this bylaw doesn't, uh, the proposal uh, for the article doesn't really change the fundamental purpose of the bylaw or the way it works at all. What it does is it updates the bylaw to um, explicitly reference new technology that we see coming in now in applications. So we don't see a lot of applications for the big monopoles that were contemplated 20 years ago when the bylaw was adopted. Instead, we see applications for smaller wireless equipment that's typically attached to things like utility poles. And there's no reference to anything like that in the current bylaw. So one of the changes proposed here is to actually define that type of wireless facility and to include some regulations that um, discuss explicitly how we would how we regulate that here in Dover. And then there are also some, uh, yeah, you can actually skip to the next one, sorry. And there are also some other um, cleanup items as well uh, that, la that largely relate to um, removing four of the 12 pages of the, of the bylaw, which are uh, all of the details of the application process and the filing requirements and things like that. And so the planning board would like to just ex wholesale 
um, remove that entire section from the bylaw, and we will adopt uh, those details as uh, regulations rather than uh, including them in the bylaw itself. And that'll simplify the bylaw quite a bit, and it will give the town more flexibility in keeping those regulations current over time. So this, this table just summarizes in detail literally all of the changes. And these are also listed in a memo at the back, and they are uh, posted on the town website. That, that memo is available on the website. And a full red line copy of the bylaw is also available on the website. So anyone who wants to see the full detail of what the planning board is proposing in terms of these edits can um, check out the copy of the bylaw there or contact the planning board office, and uh, we'd be glad to give you a copy. So again, next Monday night, um, the 26th, the planning board is having a public hearing on this. We'll be discussing it in as much detail as anyone wants. I'm glad to answer some questions now, or just save them until then. Any questions? Thank you. And now the final article of the evening is Article 22, the prohibition of the operation of a marijuana establishment. Good evening, I'm Chief McGowan, and I am here to discuss Article 22. This article is a continuation of the process begun last year when the state voted to legalize marijuana. Dover voted no, and we had about 59% of the vote uh, coming in at no. In order to prevent a retail shop, processing plant, or other manufacturing and distribution point from opening in town, I would strongly urge the town to vote yes to implement such a ban in Dover. Currently, at least 189 of the 351 cities and towns have barred recreational marijuana operations. 59 of them are outright bans, like the one proposed. The rest are still in process with moratoriums or whatnot. Some of the reasons given for the ban in the other locations uh, talk about incompatibility with the character of the town, addiction for profit, health impacts of marijuana, um, and increased, increased community costs of enforcement, regulation, and hospitalization and most say the revenue is just not worth the cost, the true cost of, of bringing that type of business into town. Does anybody have any questions? Sir, could you please come up to the, it's, it's Article 22, thank you. The Board of Health is co-sponsoring this article, and I want to make clear to the Warren Committee why there's a technical reason that we're bringing this article forward, and that was last year when the vote as on the election ballot was the 58, 59% uh, in opposition. What was not clear was that the original authors of BQ4, ballot question 4, had carefully written it that it wasn't clear that you actually needed the town as a voters in town meeting to vote in the negative. And therefore, this is essentially a cleanup to last year's effort. Many states have a law that says it's an opt-in. Massachusetts went with the opt-out version. So that's, that's why we have to do this. Yeah. And just a, one other point that, so it's on the record. Uh, Needham has established one on the Newton line, uh, but most of our surrounding towns are not doing so. In fact, uh, with the exception of Natick, with some discussion that's unclear what they're going to do. So uh, clearly, we don't want to be sitting there with the opportunity for someone to show up. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and remind you that we will be gathering on May 7th, 7 o'clock, Mudge Auditorium.